Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Bianca Zaninian. Coming up in today's newscast. Israel's latest political drama could be over before it really began. Rebel MK Zoabi does a 180 and presents demands for her support. The White House confirms despite political turmoil, President Biden will visit Israel in June. After confirming the country's first, Israel keeps an eye out for more cases of monkeypox. At least 80 cases of the viral disease have been confirmed in 14 countries around the world. Last week's political crisis could be resolved in a matter of days or it could blow up the government. Meretz MK Jaida Runava Zoabe resigned from the coalition last week, but now it looks like she might stay. With us to help clarify what this means is Deputy Minister of Economy and Industry, member of Knesset Yair Golan from Meretz. Hello and thank you so much for being with us. Hello and thank you for this invitation. It looks like a 180 here from Zoabi. Does this mean that the crisis is over? I believe the crisis is over. I met her today here in the Knesset. I spoke uh, to her, uh, you know, uh, less than 24 hours ago. And I think that the crisis is over. All right. And what did you guys talk about? I think that uh, there were certain, you know, problems uh, from uh, from Raida point of view, and I think that uh, each one of them could be resolved in uh, in matter of days or weeks, and therefore I think that the crisis is over. So let's get into it a little bit. You said there were certain problems. She's presenting a number of demands in order to stay. And can the coalition meet these requests? I think it could be wrong uh, from my point of view to elaborate more about the different problems and uh, the way to resolve them. But I think that each one of them is not a matter of crisis. Each one of them could be resolved in a matter of, uh, as I mentioned, days or weeks. Uh, it's uh, a matter of priorities. It's a matter of uh, putting certain things in, uh, in front of the public, in front of the electorate. And I think that uh, that could be done, you know, quite easily. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pity that, you know, that we came to this point that uh, we experience uh, unnecessary crisis. But I believe it's over. OK, you believe it's over. But were you surprised by her decision to leave in the first place and, and then change her mind? What do you know about that process? Well, I was surprised. Uh, I consider myself a friend of uh, MK Zoabi Rinawi. And yes, it was a surprise for me. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the big issue here is not uh, whether I was surprised or not. Uh, the big issue is whether we are able to overcome this crisis and solve the problems. And I think that we are on the right, on, on the right path and we can move forward uh, and do what we did previously. Uh, save Israel from the hands of corruption and extremism and uh, enable the Israeli citizens uh, to enjoy a government of left and right, religious and non-religious, and uh, Arab and Jews uh, all together. I think it's a kind of, uh, of a great thing for any citizen in Israel. It shows just how fragile this coalition is. Even if Zoabi stays, it only takes one to potentially take it down. How do you see the future of the government? Well, we tend to forget that, uh, you know, in, in former governments, uh, in the last two decades, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of crises. And uh, this is not so much unique. Uh, yes, uh, this, uh, this coalition is, uh, doesn't enjoy, you know, a full domination of the Knesset. 
and there are therefore there are a lot of problems and i would say because we put so many parties together yes there are problems it's more difficult you know to move from day to to the day after but uh, by the end of the day we need to admit that this is the best government for the citizens of israel and uh, this government uh, renew a sense of uh, normality uh, for each person in israel and i think this is quite essential quite crucial Uh, to the destiny of Israel. I, you know, it's terrifying to think that uh, what could replace us, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu in the midst of his trial, uh, supporting by Ben Gvir and his bench, well, this is totally, you know, uh, destructive for the future of Israel. And therefore, well, I think that, that we have a good government. Well, talking about the future of Israel, do you believe uh, if this crisis or the next is not solved after all, do you believe we will be going to another round of elections? Well, I tend to say that uh, this government is more stable than we admit. Uh, and I think that there are good reasons, very good reasons for all parties Uh, to continue with this initiative, with this project. And, I th- and, and as I mentioned, it's the best thing that Israel could uh, dream, dream of, you know, in this uh, current political situation. But according to a new survey by Israeli Radio 103, Meretz does not pass the blocking percentage. It's, it's irre- irrelevant right now. I think that, you know, all these pools... Are totally irrelevant. We have no election right now. Uh, the Israeli voter has no true reason to, to, to say something which is meaningful. And therefore, I think that uh, all we see right now is a bit uh, problematic. Uh, I don't take it, you know, too mm-hmm. seriously. But I have to admit that, yes, we have a lot of hard work to do in order to convince the Israel uh, public that we are the left, the Zionist left, we are the right solution for the problems of Israel. Lots of hard work ahead. Thank you so much, Deputy Minister of Economy and Industry, Member of Knesset, Yair Golan from Meretz. Thank you very much. A political puzzle where each piece fits a larger picture if put in its right place. Tomorrow, Defense Minister Benny Gantz will bring to a vote a bill on financial support to IDF veterans. A bill that has become a centerpiece in a political game between the governing coalition and opposition chief Benjamin Netanyahu and his Likud party. Let's take a look at the report with Asaf Nissan. A proposed coalition bill to fund tuition scholarships for newly released soldiers from the IDF is being held up in the Knesset and causing uproar in Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party. The opposition leader says he supports the idea of the bill but does not support legislation sponsored by the current Israeli government. Netanyahu has argued that passing a specific measure is less important than the need to highlight the issues of the government which recently lost its majority and to show that it is unable to pass legislation. But the issue of benefits for IDF soldiers and veterans is a key pillar for many Israelis and for many politicians within the Likud. The bill aims to fund a two-third tuition academic scholarship for combat unit veterans, lone soldiers and new immigrants, as well as soldiers of low socioeconomic status, causing many Likud members to go against the opposition leader's decision. Netanyahu has now offered to negotiate with the government, requiring the bill to increase funding from two-thirds to 100% of the tuition. That would add about 50 million shekels to the budget. Thank you.
גם על המשרתים היום. The coalition instead announced it will bring the bill to a roll call on Monday so that each member will have to vote out loud and in public. Now, despite the political turmoil in the Knesset, the White House reportedly confirmed U.S. President Joe Biden's upcoming trip to Israel. More on this report. Preparations are underway for the visit of the American president to Israel. Over the weekend, Washington reportedly informed Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's office that the trip, Biden's first to Israel as a president, will happen as planned. Biden is expected to land in the end of June, although a date still hasn't been scheduled. This led to rumors that the visit could be canceled due to the ongoing turmoil in Israeli politics. Last Thursday, a second member of the coalition, Meretz MK, Jaida Rinawi Zoabi, resigned, leaving the government in a minority and raising the possibility of an election. Zoabi is reportedly in talks to return, with government officials saying the crisis will be resolved in a matter of days. During his visit, Biden is set to meet with Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and President Isaac Herzog. He will then continue to Bethlehem, where he'll meet with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. The last months, Israel has seen some tensions with Washington, including criticism of Israel's plans to advance settlement building in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. The U.S. also condemned the recent death of Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, who was shot during an Israeli raid in the city of Jenin and called for a full investigation. In addition, the White House criticized Israeli police conduct during the journalist's funeral. Meanwhile, the U.S. has reportedly agreed to participate in a large-scale Israeli drill simulating a strike on Iran's nuclear facilities later this month further strengthening the cooperation between the two countries. Cases of the viral infection monkeypox, which can cause a rash, fever and aches, have surged around the world. With us to discuss the situation is Professor Cyril Cohen, head of the immunotherapy lab at Bar-Ilan University. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Bianca. Yes. So Israel has one confirmed case. It su suspected another, which was uh, disproven. But still, there seems to be an awareness. Do we know the source of the first infection? And could it infect others? So this is correct. Uh, so for the first question, yes, we know more as this person is came back from Europe. And we know that right now there is an outbreak. It's, it's a minimal outbreak, but still. It is a bit concerning of that uh, monkeypox. The main thing that is concerning us is that we are not able to trace that directly from Europe to Africa, because this is an endemic situation in Africa. So we are used to that in Africa, but in Europe, less. Uh, and the second thing is that basically what we know so far is that it is a disease that can, of course, infect other people. We might expect a few other cases, but still, I have to tell you that in order to be contaminated, you need to be very close to the person sick. Uh, it's either by touching the blisters or really to have uh, a contact that lasts several hours in order to get infected. So from that, uh, I would say, standpoint, we are not overly concerned, but we need to understand better what is going on. Not overly concerned, but still needing to understand uh, the bigger picture and what is actually going on. But what are the symptoms to look for and how, who would be considered high risk from being contaminated and um, from developing severe symptoms? Yeah, so monkeypox usually develops during, I would say, three to four days. After that, during a period of 10 days, two weeks to four weeks, you can have symptoms of blisters, of fever, of, uh, of uh, swollen lymph nodes. So these are usually, I would say, uh, and rash, these are usually the symptoms that need to be, uh, I would say, aware of. Uh, the people at risk are usually people that are either immunosuppressed, immunocompromised, or young children. Uh, uh, the mortality usually uh, is seen uh, in Africa in people that are uh, young, very young, and that do not have access to regular medical care. But usually in healthy people from the age, you know, from adolescent, to uh, all the people, usually you fare a good chance of, you know, getting rid, of, getting rid of that quite easily. 
Now, Professor, this has been called the most important outbreak in the history of monkeypox in the Western Hemisphere in decades. How concerning is this, really? So I, I'll tell you that, you know, we know that every year hundreds to a few thousand cases are discovered in Africa. And we know that there are two strains, the West African strain and the uh, Central Africa strain. So luckily for us right now, we're dealing with the West African strain, which is less lethal and less problematic than the other strain. Mm. But still, we are seeing now community transmission of that virus in Europe, which has not been described earlier at that intensity. So that's why right now we need to trace and cut the transmission, transmission chains so that, you know, it will not evolve more than that. But on the other hand, I'm not, we, we are not in a situation like COVID, for example. I think that we are all suffering a little bit from PTSD from COVID. So every virus seems like, you know, we're going back to lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. No, that's not the case. We need to trace that. And hopefully within a few weeks, I really hope it will be behind us. Now, you mentioned COVID. This is not the only surge we're seeing currently around the world. We are seeing unusually high numbers of cases of polio, hepatitis. They're being registered in various countries around the world. And some doctors are connecting it to the coronavirus itself or perhaps to a vaccine fatigue or even a, an anti-vaccine sentiment. Do you believe there's a connection here? Why are we seeing all of this right now at this moment? Yeah, polio is actually concerning, and I'm more concerned about polio than I am about, for example, monkeypox, because polio has long-term effect in, in, in certain populations, and we have a vaccine that is extremely efficient against polio. And again, in Israel, unfortunately, certain groups have decided not to immunize their kids, and they're putting them at risk. Regarding the hepatitis, we don't know much. We know that it, is, it has a connection with the adenovirus uh, number 41, and now we are trying to understand if there is a connection also with COVID. It's not clear enough. But again, we have to be aware that viruses are circulating always around. And uh, in any case, we have to take measures in order to prevent the spread of certain viruses. You know, for flu, we're OK. But for polio, we need to invest time and resources in order to prevent the spread and encourage people to go and get vaccinated. All right. Time and resources and trying to avoid this uh, post-COVID panic that we all seem to be uh, uh, worried about. Thank you very much for being with us today and giving us your insights. Thank you very much. Now to a Hollywood story, this time happening in real life. 126 artists blaming Israel for the death of Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh and calling for accountability. More on this report. From the red carpet to the streets of Janine, a group of Hollywood stars, including famous director Pedro Almodovar and actors Susan Sarandon and Mark Ruffalo, have signed a statement calling for, quote, meaningful measures to ensure accountability for the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh and other Palestinian civilians. Abu Akleh was killed during an Israeli raid in the West Bank city of Janine. Local eyewitnesses and Al Jazeera immediately blamed Israel, who in response asked the Palestinian authorities for cooperation to investigate what happened on the ground. The following day, images emerged of armed Israeli forces clashing with Palestinians during her funeral causing international outcry. Although an investigation has not been completed, the wording of the artist's letter leaves no room for discussion. We're deeply disturbed by the Israeli occupation forces killing of the highly respected Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. The attack by heavily armed Israeli forces on Palestinian mourners further dismayed and horrified us. What are we to make of the brazenness and cruelty of this attack on human dignity? The letter continues to state that Israeli forces have a pattern of violence, including against journalists. Every few months, a new letter signed by Hollywood stars comes out concerning Israel and the Palestinians. In other news, is spoken Hebrew on its way out? A hundred years have passed since the Hebrew language was revived by Eliezer ben Yehuda, but while words like agvaniot and glida, that's tomatoes and ice cream, are now part of our daily lives, so are more and more foreign words. Is this a danger to the Hebrew language or just a trend? 
Joining us to discuss are Joel and Orly Ganor, CEOs and co-founders of Ulpan O. Hello and thank you so much for being with us. I'm, I'm just going to go right into it. Are we witnessing a period in which the Hebrew language is going, to, going through a significant change of adopting foreign words up to the point that Hebrew could actually disappear? So we don't really think so. We, we really, really appreciate Ben Yehuda's uh, work, tremendous work. He was a really courageous and bold person. And what he did stays and remains with us till this day. He had to be very creative to do so. For instance, to make the word airplane, he took the root of the word air, avir in Hebrew, and turned it into aviron. And so with many other words. In doing so, he actually left us a legacy of inventing more, like in modern English. Bianca, if you were given a text in Shakespearean English, would you be able to uh, cast it for the viewers? I don't think so, right? But it's still English. It's not the Shakespearean English, but it's still English. Well, I guess that that's because languages are always in evolution. They're always evolving. So. Tell us what are the main changes in the language we see right now, and how do you choose to? Uh, how did you find a way to convey these new ch new changes? So you know, we do have the um, Hebrew Academy, the academy that gives us the uh, authority that gives the authority to the uh, Israelis, which words we should use and which words we don't use. But in another real life, important source for you know, modernization of Hebrew is the Israeli army, where Hebrew is constantly rejuvenated by its slang. Since the army now uses our Hebrew program to study Hebrew for the new immigrants, we constantly listen how soldiers in the army speak, and we use their innovations in our Hebrew courses. Well, we've heard about the army, but how does the Israeli media fit into the assimilation of these new language changes? So that's really interesting. Our media, the Israeli media, really invents new words. And the way uh, it uh, kind of implements it into the culture is by describing things and using the new words. And immediately, people understand the meaning of the new word. Actually, the Israeli media is a bit different from the regular, you know, the language there is different from the regular Hebrew. For instance, unlike English, which doesn't like to use passive voice, whenever I write something, it usually corrects me to do the active voice. But in the Hebrew media, using the passive voice is their motto. And it's sometimes very difficult for people who don't know. So what we do is we produce a media publication on a weekly basis we call it the e-tone. It's a pun. In Hebrew, e-tone means a newspaper. So by doing that on a weekly basis for different levels, we actually open the gateway for our students to understand the Israeli media, its special, unique language, and practice it. Opening the gateways for more understanding. Yoel and Orly thank you so thank much. Thank you, Bianca, for hosting us. Thank you. Let's take a look now at the weather forecast. Tonight, the forecast calling for predominantly clear skies with lows averaging about 16 degrees Celsius or 60 Fahrenheit. Then more clear and sunny skies expected around most of the country tomorrow. With highs on the cooler side, we see top temperatures of 23 to 28 degrees Celsius or 73 to 83 degrees Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel and around the world, check out our website, ILTV.tv. You can also subscribe to our newsletter and join us on our streaming platform at ILTV+. You can catch all that all across your devices. I'm Bianca Zanini. Be well, and thank you so much for watching. Stay informed with the latest Israel news, live programs, culture, kosher cooking, and more on ILTV+. Subscribe on any device now and get a free month trial. Go to www.iltv.tv, add ILTV Plus on Roku, or download ILTV Plus from the Apple or Android app stores.